go lie. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. And... Howdy. So, uh, I'm going to start off by saying right now, I don't know how long tonight's going to be. Um, it could be a case of... It, it's going to depend on, um, honestly, on my stomach. Because, uh, as I said in the introduction video, as I um, said in the stream, and I don't like doing this, I don't like... To, but I also don't like suddenly ending something and, you know, not giving anyone any warning. Um, yeah, really, the last 48 hours have not been good for retention of food. Uh, wise and so um, basically uh, I, I have just had some toast and I'm hoping that's okay and I'm gonna have a little bit of iron brew because frankly I probably need the quinine and I probably need some of the other stuff in that as I'm fairly sure I know why I'm and why I am being ill and um, yeah we'll see We'll see what happens. Now, if I just quickly... Do that... The questions should start to appear. Yay! The Q&A's appeared! Yay! The Q&A's appeared and it's working. So, hello Tashti Vishar, hello John Shea, hello Steve Clark, hello Tanif, hello Michael, hello um, 9681, hello DG40, and hello Stafford, hello Byron, hello DeBrock. Yes, I am starting a bit early this evening, but again, I'm starting while I'm capable and running. I do have a video, if it ended too early, I have a video I would start. Um, I have got some backup, I have got some backup videos for if I'm ill. I have got a key ship series, which is literally called If Ill or Indisposed Key Ships. <laughs> I haven't ever used any of those episodes yet, but um, the one which is uh, loaded up is Shabidus, uh, Scylla and Shabidus. I'm not sure how good they are, because I actually recorded them when I wasn't feeling that well. Um, but I was okay enough to do a, a, do, a do the videos, because they were all recovered, but I suddenly it was while I was feeling ill, was a bit shocked, worrying, oh, I've got nothing if ever I'm ill to cover a life. I'd better record these videos. So I did. And now it's a case of I'm looking back and thinking, well, you know the sound works on them, but how good are they going to be? We'll see. Hello, everyone. Ah, uh, don't worry. So, nice area front. Why didn't the British argue that the gun limit on the Washington should be 18-inch guns, given they had 18-inch guns in service? Because, ultimately, HMS Furious had been a bit of a disappointment, and the 18-inch guns, as interesting had they been as they had been, hadn't the ones in service were not as good as the ones they planned. And because they got other concessions out of it. You have to remember, the, big, the British plan was... In a nice way, if they'd argue for 18-inch guns, then everyone would have had to build some new battleships. And the British were very happy with the idea of them being the only ones building any brand new battleships. So everyone else was completing off designs which were designed before World War One, even let alone before before Jutland, let alone World War One ended. Um, all those designs were stabilised and confirmed. So, in the nicest way, the, for the Royal Navy, there was a huge advantage in having the two most modern battleships in the world, and that's what they went with. And that's the Rochelle. With regards to sturdy replacing BT, what about other candidates such as the Roebuck, Packnam, and that were associated with the uh, British uh, Battle Cruiser fl uh, Fleet, or even like Richmond, Drax, or Keys? Um, you're dealing with people at various levels of ranks who aren't senior enough. So you've got some in there who, at the time we're talking about, are rear admirals, not vice admirals, so they're not senior enough. And also, you've got the fact that Sturdy has experience with with uh, with battle cruisers and is part of the Grand Fleet. It's very easy for him to be put in position. Anyone else you're having to get in from elsewhere. And that was also one of the reasons why I went with um, a car accident. Because people could initially thinking, well, BT will be back in six months. So we'll use 
someone temporarily, and Sturdy could do it temporarily for six months. Uh, it, uh, once you realise that he's got bo both arms, both legs broken, lung punctured, and has got severe uh, severe concussion, head trauma, etc., you know that's going to be a year at least before he's seaworthy. And that's the big thing. It's got to be it's being seaworthy. I have seen some interesting responses, though, on that. And actually, what I will do, I'll open up my comment section. Give me a second. Uh, because there have been some people who've come with some very interesting ideas. Um, but some, I've, I have to say, I have, you know, had to almost shoot down a bit. And, and, I, and it, what, not meaning shoot, shoot down, but you know what I mean. It's just basically, uh, they've had a couple of interesting train of thought, but they, it, it's then you go in there and you go, well, actually, no, sadly enough, the history doesn't make that possible. Um, because that's an interesting idea, but it's just not going to work. So if I add on this one, yeah, that's quite cool. So we had from this one, we had Dazzard, who Dazzard, a 9921, who did an interesting one of. I still don't think Sturdy would have been able to take over from BT because politically Churchill was a BT supporter. So Jellico would maybe make a, maybe cause a political issue with Churchill if he replaced BT with a Sturdy. With Sturdy, I think Sturdy was blamed for the loss of the Falklands fleet before avenging it. Letters of false reports of Jutland replaced the Jellico meant uh, Churchill was never in Jellico's camp, even though Fisher had him as his protege. No one was in better at all. Another Churchill mistake, in my view. That's what it's going to be. There's some more issue that, and I did respond this to us. I can see a line of thinking, but there are some issues. Churchill resigned from the Admiralty in November 1915. Remember the events I was taking place? The uh, the, the um, car accident happened in December 1915, so after Churchill's left. And that was another reason in my timing. I didn't mention that, but that was another thing in my timing. But I didn't want to make it all about Churchill. The moment you mention Churchill, it's going to become all about him. So it wouldn't really matter much what he thought. He's off serving on the front. This is why he didn't come up in the video. He was not in the succession. Um, the first sea lord in this period was Arthur... First lord... I, shouldn't, I, I managed to write, I get that confused. First lord of the Admiralty. Because I was thinking about Jellico going on to become first sea lord. First lord of the Admiralty. Was Arthur Balfour, and he was and Arthur Balfour, he was firmly in the Let Admiralty decide the commissions camp. The battle cruiser fleet could not be left without the leadership, and if BT is sufficiently incapacitated, then he can't go to sea. Then he would be replaced. I'd add that Jellicoe's promotion for the sea law was more to do with the Admiralty not getting grasp on some marine problem and needing new leadership to come and run the war. Uh, they couldn't give him a sideways push, as that would be a uh, beating the motion, so they made it Jellico first SL, so he was in charge of everything. He then made sure BT was surrounded by his officers in order to ensure the smooth running of the ground fleet. The letters were less a factor contemporaneously than when viewed historically. Such things were not an uncommon practice of officers in the period, and especially after the fisher Beresford feud, which was kind of expected by the public. There are all sorts of interesting things out there. There you go, back to the questions. But no, um, so there are lo there's lots of interesting ideas coming through, but one of the big problems that mostly comes about is the fact that is the whole sort of the timeline we're talking about. And also, quite a lot of people don't understand quite how much there is less than politics involved. In that, as much as BT might want to stay in post, as much as BT might desire to stay in post, he can't. If he's injured, he cannot physically go to sea. And then they will go, the mechanisms will work. It might go, but I want to stay. Come on, you're, it doesn't matter. You're in, you're in hospital. You're not going to see. You know, Henderson would have liked to stay for Sea Lord running that, but he was get ill, Ill and even a sea, uh, even a land posting. Eventually, you can't go to sea. You can't be left in charge of it. It's the same in any other circumstance. So as much as politically you might, as much as you might want to stay in a post, you can't. I'm not going to let the Battlecruiser fleet... Oh, the Battlecruiser fleet is going to sail around under command of Rear Admirals because BT's ill. No one's going to allow that to happen. They're a detached independent force. That's how they've been marketed. You cannot have a detached independent force of that strength going around with someone who isn't at least a Vice Admiral. And in the nicest way, with the political impact of BT being hurt, you're going to need someone who's also politically well-known. 
and sturdy is you know there there is there is a reason Churchill has to give him the char has to let him go do the hunting down of von Spey rather than take the blame for von Spey. It's because Sturdy has his own political connections, and this is something which a lot of people keep overlooking. Sturdy is not without connections. Most of those, I would say, are in the conservative portion a portion of the British political system. And so that also means when we've got Arthur Balfour as First Lord of the Admiralty, uh, there's a difference to going on there. All right. Um, Stiglock, so I mentioned a video about finding BT replacement. You looked at James in particular, so there was not much time to show his career. Would you consider a video on him? Yeah, I did consider it. There's a couple of the couple of those officers I'd like to do. I'd like to do. Look, I have this. I have this um, theory that next year I'm going to do carriers and flagships, right? And I'm going to introduce key aircraft alongside key ships as a series. And then I think longer term, I'm eventually going to c include key uh, key people. I'm not going to call it quite key officers because there are going to be some people who are not officers. But it's going to be called key people. And that's going to come up in the year after, which is going to be leadership theme. So in the year after it could be aircraft carriers and flagships next year and then it'll be leadership in 2025. And so then key people are going to come in. And so then people like James etc are going to come up then. Which means I have to make a note of it now so I don't forget that I said I'd do that. In terms of James. I doubt I would but you never know. So I've seen it suggested that if the US invaded Cuba, the British would walk out of NATO. Why? NATO is a defensive alliance. NATO is a defensive alliance. If America went offensive and invaded invaded Cuba, then NATO does no uh, doesn't have to activate at all. That's the thing. So in the nicest way, they can leave it. However, if that leads to a Soviet response, that could cause all sorts of issues with NATO and with the U with the US, etc. But there are problems which we dealt with on other scenarios. I don't see Britain necessarily walking out of NATO because the US invades Cuba. I don't see necessarily the US finding it a nice time either, diplomatically. It's, uh, it's one of those things. There are lots of ways for NATO for NATO member nations to make the U.S. have trouble diplomatically without being overt without overtly being doing anything which can cause anyone in America to complain about. That's the whole point of diplomacy, being able to speak out of both sides of your mouth. It's so similar to politics. Um, Dubrock, start if done done in nineteen forty one. Germany takes Moscow. Who would take over? No idea. That's a kind of interesting idea because at that point, Stalin pretty much done a very good job of killing off all potential opposition. Khrushchev certainly hasn't risen to the position he was. You probably find a troika would take over, of various power people. Beria probably would be involved, but I'm not sure who. Who and would the USSR drop out of war? Potentially, they potentially could collapse. Uh, there's no good English language sources on that. Actually, Michelle, I wasn't worrying about seniority, but was wondering about the suitability of options. Uh, Tashi Rochelle, the Na Royal Navy would worry about seniority. That's the thing. You might not worry about its seniority, but the Royal Navy will do. The Royal Navy at the time will do. Otherwise, in a nice way, Turt is the who person you go for. If you are not worried about seniority, you go straight down to Commodore Turret, who's in charge of the Harwich Force, because, again, he's used to commanding independent forces. And he knows how to coordinate with battle cruisers and light, cru light cruisers and all those, all those fleets. So nice way he's the person you go and pick, if you're not worrying about seniority. The moment you're worrying about seniority, though, that's the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy is going to be worrying about seniority. There is a reason Vice Admiral Derek Grafell is not sent down to the Falklands, and is said the Task Force Command is retained in the UK. So that they don't see a vice admiral, because if we lose, it's considered bad, worse if we send down a vice admiral. Whereas if we win, 
then the rear admiral comes back and gets pro uh, gets all sorts of credits. But also, the admiral uh, the admiral back home can also claim all sorts of credits who did the task force command from home. Uh, and that's the sort of thing. But in a nicer way, not deploy not deploying a senior more senior admiral, you are lowering your risk of of damage. Well, the same happens in World War One, where you have to deploy a senior admiral. You cannot afford the battle cruiser force to be going or a fleet to be going around without a without a vice admiral in charge of it, and that's got to be a vice admiral who's senior enough to be a vice admiral of an independent command. So it can't be a randomly promoted rear admiral. It can't be all sorts of options. Yeah. I said, how much topics could have been fitted in a twenty-four and to a twenty-four and a half inch torpedo? No idea on the top of my head. I would have to look that up. That's more a off the top of his head Drac question than an off the top of his question, uh, off the top of his head Alex question. Um, unless I'd been reading up torpedoes that uh, that uh, that day, it wouldn't be in, up there because it's one of those stats which. I would read up and put in a book, it would factor into some thinking, because I'd be thinking how how that's going to relate to it, and then it would be a case of, now nah, move on to the next thing. Right on. If the guided missile takes precedence as land strike option for some reasons, do we see the development of Priuses of, Priuses of Virginia and Ohio SGNs early instead of SBNs? Um, potentially. So, Richards, I, I watched Drag's video on BT vs. Hippo after your excellent presentation. Did you have a little cameo in the video? I cannot remember. I've done... I've helped him with some videos, but I can't remember if it was that one. That was that one. It was on that one. Ronan, has there ever been a situation where we know of where a commander who was senior was put into post with a second-in-command who was the actual commander because that was the only way to get the senior officer acting as more of a mouthpiece figurehead? Um... There have been times where basically a deputy commander has been in charge. Uh, if you consider Vian and, in to an extent, Fraser and Rawlings in the British Pacific Fleet. And the good example is Vian's technically third in charge of the fleet and is technically only in charge of the aircraft carriers, but when he starts driving his aircraft carriers, everyone else has to follow him to look after the aircraft carriers. So he's basically deciding where they're going to go and what they're going to do. And that's the scenario you have. Uh, Steve Clark, question two. So, looking at communications, how suitable were flags to code messages? They're not exactly a covert information source. Yes, but you also need to understand know what those flags represent and what those codes represent to work it out. So, um, it's not exactly a covert information source, but unless you intercept the flags, I get copy all the signals down, and I'm enraged to do so, and can then translates those into what they mean so you have a copy of the signal book and then you know what those phrases mean in terms of their code phrase if they are them uh if they are coded it, it, it becomes very difficult my turn how likely is it the rn have two implacable of air wing of 36 c fires 36 barracudas and 18 months but i don't know if 9041 that one will end up with cunningham if they have two such of those vessels, one could probably end up with Cunningham. One might well end up in the Far East with Ark Royal, but one could end up in with Cunningham. But the thing is, it's what's likely to uh, where it's Cunningham likely to be. Again, you're probably presuming that if war holds off to 1942, Cunningham is still the Mediterranean fleet, and that's potentially the case. But it's also potentially not the case. Because it depends what Japan's done in 1941. And that that's the thing. I don't see Japan going past 1941 historically when they do go. I don't see them getting much past that without starting a war. Because of the their resources their issues. So the thing is, I don't think we're on I don't think under any circumstances the Royal Navy get till nineteen forty two to prepare for war. They maybe get till nineteen forty one. All right. All 
Right, I'm just moving the live chat because it's going so fast I've lost track of some things. So I'm, I'm trying to keep track of both that and the... Um, if I move that to there... Ba -da -da -dee. Oh, now I've got a live chat on the control. Hello, Daniel Politics. Hello, Sean Mack. Hello, David Golding. Hello, Black Girl Maximus. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, John Culver. Hello, everyone. Who's right in? So, no, did it with both flags? Did most navies use the same single flags, or did navies use proprietary ones? Um, that's an interesting question. Quite a lot of navies end up with very similar flags, and there now is an internationally recognised flag system, but there wasn't at all for all of history. Um, but some navies did use their own. So if we consider, this is a Hutchinson's pictorial history of war. This is from... Well, it was broadcast... Uh, the last broadcast it's talking about was the 29th of November, 1942. Now, for those who don't know, and you probably don't, If we go back to 1942, and we look at November, now this comes out on the Thursday, okay, 29th of November was a Sunday, so this is from Thursday the 3rd of December 1942. Just thought I'd put that out there. Scylla? We've got a US aircraft carrier in the Pacific. We've got a new type of Spitfire, which is taking a larger air engine, the Rolls Royce Merlin 61. Two underslung radiators. Let's see, we got oh, we've got a nice map of Stalingrad going on here. Various pieces of artillery. Ah, there we go. We have the king and queen visiting people. The post office research station in Sun in London. Watch technicians and craftsmen at work. And this was a lady winding radio coil. The sinking of the Fr the scuttling of the French fleet in Toulon. Picture of Montgomery drinking tea. Um, there's a really interesting profile of the French fleet in here, but there you go. There we got some of the British, uh, uh, some of the. Um, British and American vessels involved in the landings of Operation Torch, I think. Yes. Um, if you look at them, you can probably work out what they are in terms of their superstructure, etc. What this vessel looks like. This one's kind of easy to work out. That's a nail rod, isn't it? This one is, if I'm not mistaken, because I can see two turrets forward. I can see one turret off, and there's twin tunnel of twin stacks. So I'm reckoning that's Renown, judging by the shape of everything else. And then we have this down here. And I'm reckoning that's a, that's a fourth ship. I'm reckoning that's an aircraft carrier. Hence the aircraft flying over above. Hmm. 
Lots of cool pictures of the French ships. And a nice work for the yard in Toulon. Let's see what the question's going. Do, 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 do. So anyway, what is the most beautiful ships you've ever seen in terms of construction, craftsmanship, and decoration? Um, that I've been on. Um, well, I'm always a big fan of the victory, but if I wasn't going for the vi victory... What is the, uh, it's the Italian. If you've ever got a chance for it, I will always recommend people go on the Merigo Vespucci of the Italian Navy. It's an absolutely beautiful vessel. It's their sail training vessel. And I've got been treated to lunch a few times on board that ship, and it's been lovely every single time. So I'll give it on. What needs to change in British aircraft carrier design? Mean? Well, nothing much needs to change. What they need to do is actually be built earlier. And if you want them bigger, you've got there's some things you've got to add on which just aren't around in the 1930s when they need to be built. Um, but yeah, a lot basically for that on that question. Uh, they're in on. I remember that the older radios tended to be had non-adjustable factory tuning. How much of a hindrance was this for both signal and counter signal operations in both World War and World War Two? It was uh, an annoyance as anything for counter signal, but for signal, it's great. Gentiles, is it considered better if you lose ships but to trying to remote control a fleet in the 80s? Um, honestly, the fact was they they couldn't do that. And that was one of the big problems with the Falklands, was that you had task group commanders down there who were all task group commanders, i.e. Clapp and... and um, you had Clapp, who was task group of the Amphibious Task Group. You had Sandy Woodward, who was task group of the Amphibious Carrier Battle Group, and etc., and the trouble is, because Sandy's a rear admiral, people expect him to be in charge. And he's neither able to... He's not given the staff to be in charge, and he's not in charge. And sometimes Sandy Woodward actually forgets he's not in charge and starts issuing orders, because he's fed up with trying to send orders, but to task force requests they do. So he tries to send them directly, going, I'm rear admiral, I'm in charge. And then he'd get the message back from Clap, which basically going... Can't do that. Sorry, old boy. Um, a, you're not in. A, you're not in charge of the task group. But I would normally would work with you if I could. But B, unfortunately, um, we don't have enough helicopters to offload that ship that quickly. So we can't do it any faster than we are doing it. So you might want to sail things. We can't do that. Um, and it caused fun. You basically, you needed Derek Grafell. And Derek Grafell actually didn't end up going down there, I think, after the war was over. Uh, I'm not sure if it was he went down. Someone went down in in HMS Bristol. And basically took charge of lots of things. Now, this is from the next Thursday. Russia's Offensive. And the Navy in North Africa, Africa by Right Honourable A.V. Alexander. And look at this picture. There are two destroyers with HMS Rodney off North Africa. Now. One of those is an L class, you can tell by its 4.7 inch guns. Excuse me a second, I'm just going to borrow this camera detach from the boom. Now. I 
can see. Yeah. That's a pretty cool picture. And this is a whole thing written up by the First Lord of the Admiralty. We have wild cuts. We have a Trump Brook. We have Atrimus Argus. And people come to me and go, you know what, the escort carrier, that's a new idea in World War II. And you sit there and go, uh, go, have you seen this thing called Argus, which is a converted liner? No, escort carriers, they're a completely new idea. No one's ever had it before in World War II. Look at this ship. Okay? Look at it. Okay, the naming and branding might be new, but look at this ship. Ooh, we have Cunningham. We have Mark Clark. We have Admiral Dalan. And we have Eisenhower. All photographed together. Ah, Dalan, you are much preferred to a certain de Gaulle. We have Searchlight said Gibraltar. Air attack on Algiers. German tanks bound for the Spanish border. Not a good idea, by the way. Tanks do not do well in the Pyrenees. RAF light bombers carrying out low-level daylight attacks. Thunderbolts. Stay. Stay. There you go. Now, Daniel Potts, I was like, what is this publication? Is it held by you? These are the Hutchinson's Pictorial History of the War. I think the British Library does hold them, but I tend to buy them my own because I buy them in bulk from eBay and I'm trying to slowly build up a full set of them. The entire way through World War II and World War I, they produced a weekly picture magazine. The World War I ones are really, really difficult to get hold of, but you can get a hold of World War II ones. And of course, because they're printed in the 1940s, the pictures are now out of copyright. So, yeah, you can you you can take pictures of these other books and use them, which is great for a historian like me. Right then, um, same it for a Nimrod's ASW. How loud are Guppy Ballo class submarines? Not commenting.
Uh, Steve Clark, question three. I was watching one of Drax's old videos on the Zero. His guest showed the radio communication has issues in the Pacific, South Pacific due to high frequency interference. How did this affect radar? It did affect radar. Um, let's put it this way. There's all sorts of various anomalies in various parts of the world which have impact on electronic communications and systems. And in almost each area, you need to have experience operating there in order to see if they're effective if, uh, and affected. One of the interesting things that people often forget about Type 45s is a, an advantage for us as an alliance for, Brit uh, for Britain and for America that Britain doesn't have the Aegis system is that the Aegis system has very has will experience certain impacts of certain things in certain parts of the world. Well, the Type 45 system is different and will experience different impacts in different parts of the world. So the two systems therefore complement each other quite well. Um, in terms of radar specifically, it often produced it produced either a shortening of effective effective range in terms of detection range, but also would produce issues with things like return strength. The rock riffing on my earlier question: If the SSR doesn't collapse and they come back as in our time, how could would the Cold War change about Stalin? Would it even happen? Yes, it would happen. And you're presuming that the people who replace Stalin are any better than Stalin? I wouldn't be surprised if another dictator rose to power. I'm, I'm sure it would start off as a committee. I have no doubt it would end up in a dictatorship. Uh. Vachel, the general the photo reminded me, what do you think about the General Sikorsky accident there? Do you think it was a Soviet assassination accident or other allied agencies? Doubt it was other allied agencies. An accident could be. Stupidity is a strong possibility. And potentially a Soviet, uh, a Soviet assassination. But, you know. They are fun. Lyanus, uh, de Gaulle, who refused to visit the battleship Riculu for fear they would uh, pitch him into the sea. It would have been fun to watch happen. That's a cool picture. Avengers in flight. Fly, Avengers, fly! Ba da da da. Ba da 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 da. Crew coming ashore very happily. Submarines entered Alexandra, flying a Jolly Roger. The show she had actually sunk something. Always good. And we have shipbuilding in the USA. That's a cool article. That's a New Jersey. I wonder if New Jersey has that photo. Probably. Oh yeah, that was a cool photo. British submarine destroying Axis supply vessels in the Mediterranean. Hey, that's a chunky sub. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
And last one, if the British 24 and a half inch Mark I torpedo had been adopted as a standard Royal Navy torpedo of the interwar period in World War II, how does this bigger torpedo change damage to actually ship take place? Well, 24 and a half inch torpedoes are going to be a lot bigger to have to maneuver around, etc. So you're not going to be able to carry reloads. 21 inch torpedoes you can potentially be carrying reloads for. 18 inch torpedoes you can definitely carry reloads for. 24 and a half inch torpedoes on a destroyer, you're probably not going to be carrying or moving reloads because they're that much heavier. Um, if that becomes your standardized torpedo dough and you have that on your cruise and your destroyers and it's got longer range, it's going to change some of the Royal Navy tactics. There's also the fact that if you're carrying less torpedoes, you have less shots. If you have less shots, you know, there are issues. Uh, you might, you're not necessarily likely to, likely to hit. But if you manage to keep up, if you manage to improve accuracy as well, and let's say the larger torpedo is less prone to issues, and you manage, to, it has a more reliable explosive warhead, which you could theoretically make in a larger warhead because you'd have more space to accommodate reliability. Um, and do more damage, you could see more ships sunk, or roughly the same number of sunk because of the balancing of the conditions. Basically, it's one of those ones where, well, you've made it bigger, you're going to make a lot of difference, and uh, you're going to impact a lot of options, and therefore we won't really know unless we actually fight it. As comedy, Death of Stalin was a great, but his historical references are not accurate history. It's actually closer to the death of Tito to Death of Stalin, I would say. Because if you remember when Tito died in Yugoslavia, I think he I think they announced they were amputated. They, they uh, at several points they announced they were amputating his feet to help him with his illness. And it was a one uh, there was a joke going around. They'd announced they'd announce they were amputating his and they'd amputated five of his feet. Um and my one of my old lecturers who was actually visiting Yugoslavia at the time uh, said he heard it at least on four occasions, four separate days, they were amputating his foot that day and four separate days they heard it and he was basically going they've amputated his feet four times I'd say that is a highly imaginized um, cross between an S and a T. Thomas, can the Hanair jump jet be modified to do caterpillar operations like the Vistol of F-35 can? Uh, no, and why do you think the Vistol F-35 can be modified to do, uh, to do caterpillar operations? I'd be really interested because have a look at the airframe design and the structuring of harm points. And I will tell you that the theory was it possibly could be, but there is a lot of differences between a C and a B. I'm fairly sure a B can be adapted to operate from a carrier, but I don't think it's necessarily going to be a very quick or easy process. I think it's going to be actually quite a major work, which is going to require probably some time with a uh, <clears throat> put a primary engineering facility uh, of something of that le of that level, i.e. something not maybe not quite going back to the factory, but not far off it. Because whilst, and I have heard the theory put forward, when you look at, you look at the aircraft, and you actually look at the, the design, it, it becomes questionable. That doesn't really matter to me, though. Because it... You could still take... You can still operate a Vistal aircraft from a Catabar carrier. You just don't run it off. To, you just don't... You do a rolling launch and a rolling recovery. Hello, Eric H. Oh, folks. Are these airborne picks, P a PR picks shot by a Federal Reconnaissance or PR or who? Um, usually shot by other aircraft in the flight, so they're just picked out. Sometimes they're shot by Federal Reconnaissance.
Yes, the aircraft is being towed by an ass. Because, well, we didn't have anything else to tow the aircraft at the time. I can just imagine the jokes the Royal Air Force suffered from that one. The Root of Lizardman Conspiracies. Potentially. The Carmel Gazo. Potentially. Didn't the Australians use the oxygen powered 21 inch tor torpedoes? Um, I think the Australians used the same torpedoes as the British. I don't think the Australians had a different torpedo system. Um, there are several marks of British torpedoes, and some of them were oxygen powered, and some of them were not. So you could be considering an older mark of torpedo. Um, there are quite a lot of 21 inch torpedoes in the British, in the British Force. Uh, I get up the full list. So, the, the Mark II is in service in World War Two and World War One. Uh, Mark IV is well. Officially, the Mark IV torpedo might still be in service. The Mark V was used in Kent class heavy cruisers and A and B class destroyers. That had a wet heater engine. The Mark IV had a burner cycle. Uh, the Mark II had a wet heater. So burner cycle maybe. Um, then there's the Mark VII which used oxygen enriched air which was used by county class cruisers. That was a 21 inch hot torpedo. Um, so you could be thinking about, um, are you thinking about the burner or the oxygen enriched air? The oxygen enriched air torpedo might well be the one you're talking about, the Mark 7. Uh, then there's the Mark 8, which was another burner cycle design torpedo. Mark 9, which was used on Leanders and was basically an improved, to the extent, Mark 7, uh, M Mark 7, which also uses oxygen enriched air. Uh, but still, the Mark 10s were still in use. Uh, there is the Mark 10, the Mark 11. Um, the Mark 12 was planned to use high test peroxide fuel. Um, but they were sort of used. I think. The, the, yeah, the, I think it basically it's up until about Mark 12 and they're still in service in World War Two. So, yeah, um, Tashi Vichel, basically, I think what you are probably talking about is an oxygen-enriched engine. And I'm reckoning that from is the Mark 7 or a Mark um, 9. Yeah, I think Mark 7 or Mark 9 torpedo you're talking about. Oxygen enriched. I don't know, when we World War Two, when would the British Empire have started retiring the Winter War era cruisers? Mm. Most cruisers have roughly a 20 year service life in the Royal Navy in this period, so you're probably dealing with if anything ordered in the 1920s would be that it will be disappearing in the 1940s. 1930s in the 1950s. And so on. It's a 25 to 30 year service life. And it's also going to be say some will be kept on. So they'll, replay, they'll be like the C's and D's. Which are kept on for roughly. For, uh, uh, and do roughly 30 years. So some will do 30 years. But it's 20 to 30 years. And it'll be that period roughly.
That's you, Michelle. Mark 7 rings the bell. So yeah, maybe that's what my mind wandered. Don't worry, it's completely understandable. But the, it's one of those things you have to... You have to sometimes sort of... It seems really strange to us. Because today, when we talk about torpedoes in service... We usually talk about one or two types of torpedo at maximum. In that period, it was quite common to have three or four different generations of torpedo going around. The sheer number of ships you had, the different styles of launchers, etc. You'd have the different torpedoes. Let's see if you can do that. Stay. Stay. I think without World War Two messing up the economy, where do you see the British going? Because I don't know why. After the last of the pre-war, the pre-war destroyers are completed. Ah, uh, probably to some larger destroyers. They do keep playing around with the going larger, smaller, larger, smaller. Eric H, would GT John and Difford have ended up very different? Every, different. They've been a BT had had a better signalman. Now, this is one of those interesting questions that comes up quite a lot. Um, it's often fashionable to blame. The signals officer, and he's one of his officers. And the point I have to make is that there is an entire command structure. Um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to open up the file so I can read off his stuff. It's one of the things, and it's the point I try to make, really, in that whilst you have D BT aboard as the as the commander in chief, you have of the you know the battle cru the commander battle cruiser fleet. You have his chief of staff, Captain Rudolf Walter Betnick. You have Flag Lieutenant's commander, the Honourable Reginald Alma Rang uh, Ranfurly Plunkett, and Lieutenant Commander Ralph Frederick Seymour, plus, of course, Captain Alfred Chatfield, who's the flagship captain, and all the other staff officers supporting them, and all the officers aboard the Lion wandering around. So, whilst, yes, you can say Seymour's duty was to send the signals... There are lots of officers there who should be checking the wording and phrasing the signals and check the signals have gone up. There are people who literally in battle, the most important thing is going through is communications and communicating clearly. And yeah, there are lots of people there who should be should have been doing that. The fact that they didn't is a whole staff issue. And that's BT's major trouble. Is it's, it's a whole staff issue. Yes, the, um, yeah, the a magazine cost nine pence in the 40s. Cute doggy. These are Russian scouts with their rifles and their dogs. Yeah. Royal Army Medical Corps in the Middle East. Someone get Dan. Scuttling of the French fleet has another page in this one. Rear of mid upper gunners checking ammunition feeds to their guns before the flight over Italy. I would definitely be checking my ammunition feed. Oh, yeah. Here's a fun thing. Look at that. Landing on a carrier with the flight deck awash. This is another, this is the point the Royal Navy used to make when people talk about them doing deck parking and would be very critical of going, you don't deck park your aircraft, you don't carry enough aircraft, you could carry more aircraft on per tonnage if you deck parked. And the Royal Navy goes, well, we'd leave port with those aircraft, yes. We wouldn't have those aircraft for very long. Not in North Sea and North Atlantic, you wouldn't have them for very long. Um...
Lancaster Raid. The South African naval in naval might sweeper in a hoff. It's the first ship to enter Benghazi Harbour. Please look at this little note. So, it says here. Umbrella men in North Africa. Fleet air armed pilots and machines in North Africa airfield. These men are in their aircraft help to provide an effective umbrella for the huge convoys of men and material transported from Britain to North African battlefield. If you look at them going, are those swordfish? They are swordfish. There are albacores in that photo as well, but there are also sword there are swordfish in their albacores. Commentary on the war. Oh, goodness gracious me. This is the wreckage of the USS Downs and Cassin and the battleship Pennsylvania. Oh, my. These are pictures from Pearl Harbor. So how would you, the RN use its armed merchant cruisers, armed yachts, and armed supporting steamers to rescue commerce warfare against a rival power? That's the AMCs are only useful until they get caught. Well, that's the point. You use them until they get caught. They're going to complicate, complicate the task of your normal ships far more. And let's be honest, if you're the Royal Navy, you can probably use the armed merchant cruisers, etc., behind the critical areas, so in the secondary theaters, etc., where you're less likely to find enemy warships, because, let's be honest... There are going to be theatres where you're less likely to find those enemy warships. The British Empire was global spanning. Um, so they would be everywhere. And so you could, let's say you're fighting someone in the Pacific. Well, you'd have your AMCs and all those other vessels doing their job in the Mediterranean, the North of the Indian Ocean, the, North, the Atlantic, etc. Completely fine. They have more than enough firepower for what they're required to do in those circumstances. Right. I'm going to do at least enough one of these and I'm going to answer questions for a bit and then I am possibly going to go in because it's yeah it's starting to hit me so um, I will do it go for at least another one of these for all your delectations because I am enjoying this. I enjoy doing this as uh, as much as I hope you're all enjoying it. So, nice way I want to do it. But I also know that um, there's only so long I'd like to push my luck. And the thing is, unlike a Twitch stream where I can go, just watch the computer play it be computer, okay? play computer. Um, yeah. This one I actually need to talk in. Hmm. I do love these magazines. They are really, really cool.
balloon training. And um, as you can see, there is a Majesty the King in a Bren carrier. Yep. That is one very, very paranoid driver there. The king is standing next to me. If I feck up, I'm in trouble. Yep. You don't frig it up in those circumstances. Oh, great. Lord Louis Mountbatten doing Louis Mountbatten things. Always doing man button things. Japanese convoy off New Guinea dispersed by flying fortresses. I'm sure the Japanese have been surprised to learn this, but you know, perhaps they were. Perhaps they were. But myself, the only accounts the Japanese have of not flying fortresses dropping bombs was, oh, look, they're dropping bombs. Port. Uh, okay, we've avoided them. <sighs> Level bombers do not make good anti-ship aircraft. Doggy. The doggy is acting as the signal carrier. So instead of having pigeons, they now have communications dogs. This is a step up in qualifying skills. And also good boys. And girls. And before anyone says anything about that, Remember, I have two boy dogs, so I'm used to say, I'm more used to saying good boys than anything. How? No, there are other dogs as well. Oh, mounted scouts on patrol. American Destroyer, the HMS Wells. We have HMS Renown and Renown firing through the English Tower, but that has got to be a Nelson, a Nelrod. Repulse and The sister ship repulse sunk off my uh, sunk off from layer by a Japanese aircraft in December. The renown belongs to the Royal Sovereign class. No, the renown does not belong to the Royal Sovereign class. Who has been telling anyone that the renown belongs to the Royal Sovereign class? She does not. Her and her sister started out as Royal Sovereign class, but they were not Royal Sovereign class. Anyway, that'll be today's. Hutchinson's because, as I said, today is going to be a shorter video because, um, well, yeah. I'm not feeling the greatest, if that makes sense. What class did you get iron and built in some numbers to the Fletcher class? Um, probably the H's. 
the small destroyers, um, the the seas, uh, the um, seas, the uh, the war destroyer C class definitely could have been if they wanted to. Okay. So, boom. Oh, so, uh, digging around the Canadian Peril History Wiki, the Royal Canadian Navy operate four container ships. Um, how many levels in practicality would you rate this? It's not that massively high on many levels in practicality, but it's not really going to be and make life any easier. It really isn't. In fact, it's a good way to cause yourself a lot of stress. Container ships are not that fun for a naval operations perspective. I'm going to have to get up, aren't I? I don't want to. If I get up, I'm like... Oh. I don't want to also don't want to rip that off the wall. Although, how I'm going to rip that off the wall with considering the sheer number of bolts I put through that uh, into the wall, I doubt it. I sincerely, sincerely doubt it. Oh. Run. Oh, by the way, Small thing for chat to decide. Tomorrow I have my COVID injection. And as you know, usually when I have my COVID injection, if I, because I very rarely do feel like up to much, and especially this weekend, I doubt I will feel really up to much. Before anyone makes any points again, if I need to make it, uh, say again, the reason I, I don't care if anyone else has their COVID injection, I have mine because I live with my mom and sister, who basically, if they get the cold, they could be, they are going to be in hospital, their asthma is that bad. So if the jab helps me in any way prevent me passing on COVID to them, if I'm going out and it's still wandering around, then it's all good. I don't care about anyone else. It's me. It's because I live with them. So leaving that to one side. But... That means I will probably be tomorrow afternoon, after I've had the jab in tomorrow morning, um, bored and not feeling like doing anything because anything like you or normal, I will have raging backache and I do not know why I get this. I think it's just entirely weird to me. I got the same thing after the flu jab, okay? So, um, P for Porsche, if I build the Porsche. And the other option is the Ferrari. Yes. So F for the Ferrari. So if you put F or P in the chat, whichever there's most of is the one I will build tomorrow. So I don't have to make a decision. So we have the Porsche. And we have the Ferrari. There we go. Um, FFPP, PFF. Ferrari appears to be winning this one. <laughs> I think the Ferrari might have won this one. <laughs> oh, I will set up a poll. I will. I will set up a poll. In the live chat, I will set up a poll. Can I set up a poll? Uh, I can't set up a poll because I've got the Q&A running, I think. That's all timestamped now. Um... <laughs> <laughs> oh, good lord. <laughs> Why well, not both? Because I doubt I feel a lot to doing both. Uh, but yeah, uh, basically, I will set up a poll. Once I take off the questions from the q and I'll set up a poll and make it official. But uh, I think the Ferraris do have it. But we'll do it properly. We'll do a, we'll do a proper thing. 
And actually, what I'll do is I'll answer the last questions and then I'll lump quickly and then I'll de deactivate the Q&A and then I'll do a poll. I turn if the British could have found a way to fit a triple 15-inch 45 turret into the mounting for the 15-inch 42, would they have converted the 5 Korean hood into 12 and in 9? Yes, they would have done. If they could have found a way of doing it without the tonnage being a problem, they would have done it. Um, no, sir, what are the odds that without the whole standardization of 12.75 uh, 12 was thanks to NATO and America that the British would adopt the 18-inch Mark 30 Mod 1 um, potentially. The British did like the, always like the 18-inch torpedoes. I'd say there's about a 30% chance they keep on the 18-inch. And, Miriam, do you think there's a role in NATO merchant marines for a smaller cargo ship allocating, allowing for a more distributed fleet than the concentrated inherent in modern container ships? I'd hope there was, but I doubt there will be. So, I'm going to deactivate this quickly. End Q and A. Confirm. I have no idea what this will now pick up. And then I'm going to add start poll. Car to build tomorrow. Confirmation. Ferrari. And we are running the poll. Porsche appears to be winning it. Porsche does appear to be winning now. Sorry, I've got, an I've got an itch right here on the edge of my nose. So I'm, the loan looks weird, but I'm just going to scratch it. <sighs> yeah, I was going to go, yeah, right. you're itching it. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no. Um, right. Once the poll's over, I will put in, I, I will start the um, Q&A again. Rig the vote to be 50-50. It's a close one. Question four. I started on the last question as you ended. If war holds off until 42 and Japan starts the ball rolling, how much does the RN deploy the Pacific with the Germans and Italians as a threat? If you consider the sheer amount of construction the RNs will have managed by 1942 versus the Germans and the Italians, okay? So, the Italians will have completed the Torios, but they won't have done any more. The RN will have modernized all of the Queen Elizabeths, probably Repulse and Hood as well as Renown. They will have completed the King George V's, probably the Lions, and probably two Vanguards. So you're potentially talking 12 brand new ships combined with 8 old ships. At the least. What you could be dealing with as many as 14 new ships. Because it could be 6 Lions. And it could be 3 Vanguards and the 5 King George Fifths. And as well as those modernised vessels. The 8 modernised vessels. In which case the RN has 22. 
once you've got that scenario worked out in your head, you then start to think of, well, okay, what will Germany have completed by 1942? Possibly they'll have turpits in the water. So they'll possibly have four. So for the RN to feel strong at countering uh, Bismarck, Tirpitz, Scharnhorst, and Eisenhower and Scharnhorst, they'll probably want to have six ships that remain in the uh, in the UK home waters. So they'll probably go with six. I wouldn't be surprised if those six vessels were probably a pair of vanguards, a pair of King George V's, and a pair of... Mm, actually, no, possibly a pair of vanguards, a pair of King George V's, and... Possibly Hood, but more likely Renown and Repulse. Okay? Because that's pretty much viable for that job. Maybe it's two of Queen Elizabeth's, two of the Queen Elizabeth's. But I think more likely, the Monlines Queen Elizabeth end up forming the bulk of the Mediterranean fleet, along with probably um, about four, at least four of them end up in the Mediterranean fleet with at least two of the Lions. Maybe it's five and fr uh, maybe it's five and three uh, and. Free, uh, free of the King George V's. I'm not sure. But they'll be roughly what they'll be looking for. And so that's 14 used. Okay, you've got 6 in the uh, six in the home fleet, four, uh, 8 in the Mediterranean. Deal with the Italians and the Germans. So that leaves you with, at worst, 6 left. Best eight left, which are going to be the core of your Far East fleet. And that's going to be pretty much everything else. Now, the thing is, that's if Britain's taking on both Italy and Germany at the same time. That's what I was doing with Japan. And that's if Britain has just built to the existing models that they are producing. So the six lions, the five King George Vs, the five, uh, the two, at least one, possibly three vanguards, etc. The thing is, with the R class being rolled off and with them having 15 inch guns from all sorts of things, they could actually accelerate the vanguards and they could have built more than three. They could have quite easily built six of those in that time period. If the RN really wanted to. The RN also had modernised Royal Oak, and if they chose to modernise some of the other R's, they could keep them around as secondaries. And the reason you do that is because it acts as a force multiplier for your capital ships in the in the home fleet. Because then you need a reaction force of fast battleships, but you don't need any of them to be secure in convoys. Where are you getting all these personnel from? Where are you getting all these crew from? Well... If you can think about it, if you've had until 1942 and you have all the training programs you have going on uh, that are being planned and are being implemented across the world, across the Empire at this time, you will have the crew by 1942 for all those ships. It's not going to be easy, but it's doable. Right, I will end chat in... Uh, no, not chat. I will end the uh, poll in about... Let's check what level I'm at in five, four, three, two, one, ending it. I'm just watching myself counting down now. The results are Ferrari 66%, Porsche 43%, 30 votes. Thank you very much. The Ferrari has it. Start Q&A. Brew ships. One, two, five. Da, da, da. There you go. 
the Q&A started again. Nice signal. Why can't the US and their names Antrimus and Provinia and Impressivinia be used at the same time? A, they're too similar, so it could lead to confusion. B, the, you do not have an emperor and empress. You either have an emperor or an empress. You have the emperor, uh, the consort, but you have either an emperor or an empress, and yeah. That's what. Go get some crystal right, Doctor Clark. I'm gonna give you a. Let's put it this way. I'm going to be nice, but also I'm gonna say that this is going on for about another, probably twenty, thirty minutes maximum. Also, it's kind of nice for me. Don't don't take this the wrong way. But I spent most of the last 48 hours in our bathroom. In one of the bathrooms, okay? And it's a very nice room, I have to admit. It's got, it's got a lovely brown bath and sink because our house was built in the 1970s and that was the fashion at the time to have coloured things. And the bath is literally brown. Um... And it's got some interesting tiles, which some of which I put up. And it's got some interesting walls, which I need to do some repair on, I've now noticed. And it's got floorboards. It's very, very interesting. But I'm rather keen not to be in there. And the only other space other than that I've spent time in over the last 48 hours was my bedroom. Um, so it's kind of nice to be in a differential space. So I did a Twitch stream, and I've done this. So I will do this. I will, I'm aiming for the two hour mark. I must admit, that's my aim. If I can do two hours, then I don't feel I have let anyone down. And I feel I have delivered on what I normally do. But I am not a go probably going to be literally two hours and gone. But I, I, I'd like the break for two hours. Manly just got here and hand voted. I'm sorry to hear that. I ha uh, why I've been sick. Um, well, as we discussed before, we have various reactions, it seems, to what's going on in our um, around our house. My reaction is I get a my I occasionally get stomach issues, and I've had a very bad example of those stomach issues. And it was a case of we're looking and thinking, well, could it have been food poisoning? Then we looked and went, what did you eat on Friday? I went, well, I barely anything. Um, I'd literally had Bovron toast. And when you go back for the rest of the week, I had had kind of the... Basically, my meals for the last week had been meals which 12-year-old me would have been very, very happy with. They were things like cheesy pasta uh, with crispy bacon in it, which was lovely. Um, all sorts of. Things. I was literally. I've literally been eating one meal a day. So I've been basically going. I don't live. Uh, uh, you only live once, sort of thing, on the one meal a day. Going right then. I will not have a massive meal, but I will not bother about whether this meal is exactly healthy or not, because I'm going to only basically having. I only have time for one meal a day. So yeah, I had not had food which was going to cause me any trouble or would cause anyone any trouble. Um, I had mm, steak and veg. Another day, I had all sorts of. It was an it was a nice week food wise. Um, but it was literally I said one meal a day, so nothing that should have caused me any trouble. And then yeah, fun times. <sighs> I'm pleased to report the Hyder gift shop hoodie is very comfortable. It is. That's good. Uh, dark log. Avoiding cabin fever by going to the cabin. Yes! Avoiding cabin fever by going to the cabin. Look, my phone ran out of power. Don't take this wrong way, but I left all... All my phone... Uh, normally, I charge my phone in the office in here all day uh, when I'm in here, and then I just run it on battery, okay, for the rest of the time. It just makes sense. I just charge it. So they put it on the cradle... And it charges and doesn't damage the doesn't damage the battery or anything like that. Um, I don't have one of those in my bedroom because I don't know. So my phone ran out of power about like uh, um, halfway through yesterday, which wasn't too bad. But I was literally taking books into the toilet with me. 
This is how you can tell that you're a historian when you you're comfortable a comfort reading for when you're you're on the uh, stuck on the uh, porcelain throne is. Well, I, I do actually have a book in here I did take with me, didn't I? Because I brought it back in there. Where did I put it down? Yeah, what was it I was reading? I put it down. I put it down. Oh yeah, this one. I had this one with me. Operation CLI on Badly and McKinsey. Um... It is. I. 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 I have to admit. I did. I was reading through, and I was basically going. The whole problem is that even it was so. The sea lion was so far fetched that even Jones realised it wasn't going to work. So the fact this has crushed their dreams is good because basically that's all they were dreams, um, fever dreams, arguably disturbed dreams, but just dreams, not nothing real. And I did do a Twitch broadcast. What's my Twitch name? Dr. Alex Clark. <laughs> oh. No, no, there was no problems with running out of loo paper. Nicest way, the fact, uh, uh, nicest way, there is an advantage of living in a house with um, the visiting large female population that I, li I live with in terms of my family. Um... And I'm fairly certain that they have bought, uh, they have cost uh, the entire reason they have Costco cards, etc., is so that they can bulk buy toilet paper. I mean, literally, I think there's about a quarter of our our garage is just full of the stuff. I I have no it. Any every time there's a panic, they buy more, and I just look at the ever-growing pile and go, "Are we ever going to get through that? You know, are we? Are we really?" I don't know. Why does everyone think Buy American is an acceptable answer in military procurement? Because usually it's going to be okay. Honestly, in terms of buying American, usually the Buy American is, the thing is, it's probably going to work. It might be annoying. It might come with all sorts of issues. And it might come with the fact that it requires usually more personnel than most other people can fit, would like to deploy to it. But yeah, it will usually work. And you have to. There, there are other. The thing is also, it will be built. The thing is, if you want to, for example, if you want to buy domestically, build domestically, you've got to build up the industry to build it, and that's going to be very expensive. So whilst the American equipment might be expensive, it could be cheaper to actually just buy it off the Americans. And if you're not particularly fussed over whether you're not you have an inter a domestic industry or not, then it doesn't matter. No worry, don't know politics. I've been placed on a nice, a nice bookshelf magazine rack in the bathroom. Um, that is actually mm, the, the the one rule in our house is that's not allowed. Uh, mainly because my mother long ago worked out two things. One, when everybody's having a massive argument, I tend to disappear and just go, I will sort it out when it's over, like after you guys have finished having this, this fun thing. And two, <laughs> therefore, the toilets in our house are the only rooms which actually have internal locks on them. And um, I eat to lock everyone out. So if you had a bookshelf in there, I would just be disappearing off to the loons. <laughs> so that the bookshelves are not allowed. But when I have my own space, in hopefully in the annex, we're hopefully going to move in. You know, the the property we'll hopefully find a move into, etc. Um, with my own annex, so I have my own, basically flat in the house, sort of thing. Um, yeah, I will probably have bookshelves in it because I'll probably need the bookshelf space. Let's be honest, I've already filled up this office and I filled up my bedroom and I've still got boxes in the garage and boxes in the attic of books. So I am going to need a lot of bookshelves, a lot of bookshelf space. I'm going to need, it's going to need to be a very big annex. I am currently petitioning for it to be a two bedroomed one, but you know, um, that means we have to find a property with the right size. And by annex, I mean a thing which has at least a bedroom, a bathroom, and a kitchen slash lounge area. 
because I can convert the kitchen slash lounge area into my kitchen slash office area. Because I have no qualms of having a kitchen in my office. No qualms at all. In fact, it's quite nice, because it means that instead of just having a little fridge, I can have a big fridge, and I can have a little fridge as well. And I can have the cooker, and I can have all the facilities I'd like, so I can actually make myself some decent food when I want it. No, my sister hasn't. They didn't do the cooking this week. Uh, we have central water heaters, Rune on. Uh, well, I was looking at the build of shit times for ships like the tribal class destroyers. Why did the same yards take very different build times, even in peacetime? Honestly, life happens, but mostly it's to do with supplies of the incidentals, i.e. things like engines, etc., and trying to get those in. It's amazing how small delays in the supply of these those items, let's say uh, gear boxes, etc., because they require crane lifts and all sorts of things, they can build up because the crane, could, when they eventually arrive, the crane could be doing something else. And so you have to wait for the crane to be free to put it in. And you can't do X, Y, or Z. So that delays X, Y, and Z until you've put that in. And then when you're doing X, Y, and Z, you're, also, you're now delayed in a cycle and you're waiting for cranes and other things again. So everything can build up. So small delays can lead to the massive delays and differences in delivery. That's right. If the British got the Black Hawk, what are chances the government might have tried to make the Iron get taken a version of the Merlin? Even a, over the a Merlin, even though the Merlin was obviously the now, I would say the better suited for the British platform. Well, basically, what the British would have done, and don't take this the wrong way, is rather similar to what they did with the H one hundred and one. They would have bought a Seahawk, which is the anti-submarine warfare version of Black Hawk, and they would have taken it apart, and they'd have rebuilt the electronics in it. So it would have been a Merlin. But it would have been in a Seahawk airframe rather than the H-101. That is literally what the Royal Navy would have done. Because that's what we've done a lot of the time in history of uh, in history of aircraft. That's what happened with Sea Kings. That was how is what happened with lots of lots of British aircraft and helicopters in over years, which have been um, developed. And also, in a nice way, the thing about the H101, the reason the British went for it was they do like to keep a British industry building. So it had been built under license in the UK anyway. So it'd probably been a highly modified. Basically, imagine Volvo's approach to when they were Ford's when they were owned by Ford. Okay, that would be that's the wizard British approach to procuring helicopters, even our Apaches, which they're making a big fuss about. Now we've reached the same generation as the American standard. You sometimes go, and what do they have in them that is not on the American fittings? Well, yeah, I knew it. So yes, yeah. Modifications will happen. Magazine, like wouldn't that risk fumigating the books though? Um, not the books I would actually store in there. I'd probably store certain books in there that, you know, wouldn't be bothered. Also, I'd be tempted to put them behind some sort of coverage to protect them. But it also depends if the whole room's a wet room. Because the whole room's a wet room, then probably I wouldn't. But there again, I do like the idea of reading while in the bath. I like the concept of actually being able to take a long, relaxing bath. I, I probably wouldn't actually do it, but I like the concept. Because, you know, one of those things Winston Churchill used to do in various other was they would, you know, do a lot of work from their bathtubs. And... I'd just like to see if it's really as thought-provoking as it sounds. And I do enjoy a hot tub. Uh, no, we'll see. Any good books on the Franco-German War of 1870? Um, I think the hand did something, but... Um, do, 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 do. Mm-hmm. 
No, no. They all seem to be obsessed with the land war um, from the books I'm managing to find. There's... Rachel Crastle's one is considered quite good, which is called uh, Bismarck's War, the Making of Modern Europe, Franco-Prussian War, but I'm not sure that uh, the Making of Modern Europe, Franco-Prussian War, Making of Modern Europe, but I'm not sure how much naval power is in there. Um... But that could be because, in fact, whenever you look for, uh, whenever you're looking for Bismarck and naval warfare, um, the Bismarck, the battleship, shows up rather than Bismarck, the uh, Chancellor. Sadly enough, considering the Chancellor was efficiently considering more effective than the battleship. See what, Winston liked drinking champagne in his bath. I would, I could see myself drinking iron brew in the bath. I think that could be an interesting experience. Je yeah, I do agree, Churchill liked... It's kind of, like, again, like my approach to iron brew. I just like drinking it. I don't mind really where I am when I'm doing it. Boiling vessels are quite often a common thing, but I would say on the subject of boiling vessels, there's quite a lot of American forces who retroactively managed to procure that British adaptation and fit it to their vehicles as well. I, I, would, I would like to point out that when I have been invited on NATO exercises and have had the chance to wander around various American pieces of equipment, American systems, I have noticed that boiling vessels... That have been adapt have been created by the British to fit on their versions of the American equipment have magically, magically been adapted, and I have even seen boiling vessels which have been the, uh, from the versions which were supposed to fit in the Warrior appear in Bradley's, and have gone, oh my, how did you end up there? And you know, I'm fairly sure that there is a very, a very, very, um, how do I put this? A highly, highly regulated and um, organized exchange program of boiling vessels for something else. I'm not sure what the something else is, but I'm fairly sure the Americans are also procuring uh, procuring various other um, liquid supplements as well from their allies, as well as boiling vessels. So I, I, it's an interesting exchange rate is obviously going on. How to <laughs> Hi, Dr. Lark. In Edinburgh, with six bottles of 1901. You evil person. I hope you enjoy. Evil for saying that. That's good. Uh, the British tank crew. Oh no, we seem to have somehow lost our BV. How did that happen? Also, where did this two tons of ice cream come from? <laughs> <laughs> um... Yeah. Seems like so. The question: the, So the RAF get the original Gullwing naval ice at Seafar. 
do we actually know what its theoretical capabilities were? Speed, range, and ma um, max load? No, we don't. But it would have probably been not that different to the Spitfire, but it would have been a gull-winged scenario, so it would have been a capable of the landings on a carrier. Um, so that's going to mean it's going to have a far stronger airframe. That might reduce its top speed somewhat, but it's also going to mean its ability to take impact is going to be slightly higher. But it might not reduce it by that much, especially considering the engines they were talking about fitting them with. Just on, boiling vessels are now a standard kit in the US Army, at least optional kit. They now are. They now are, but it was, it was not that long ago that they were appearing unofficially. No, everyone is basically dealing for the, the German and the Belgian chocolate. I think so the British were in a better position. Wouldn't stuff like C Dart, Type 82, Type 21, Type 22 be five, ten years earlier than they were? Um, you'd be talking about completely different things being built. That that's the honest answer. This is the this is the big problem. Once you start getting alternate histories, which are moving along down, you change the economic position, you change the, the geographical and the political etc. scenario for what you're dealing with. You're going to change the resulting technological solutions. You're going to change the rate of development, and you're also going to change. So you're going to change when technology becomes available. Some's going to become earlier. Some's going to become later because of different priorities in terms of focus of spending. And you're going to change the actual procurement of what's being procured because it's going to need to be different to deal with the different scenarios. So this is one of my big problems when I start seeing alternate histories and they're still using Type 21s, Type 22s, Type 23s for that period. And they start off in the 1950s and 1940s. If you change history from 1940s onwards, I can guarantee you two things. One, it will be incredibly different. And two, those differences mean, whilst there might be things which are still called Type 21s, Type 22s, Type 23s, because the same decisions might have applied at certain points, there also might not be. And those ships which are built will be very different than the ones which were at, you know, which were, were, have been built in our timeline. Because the world will be fundamentally different. So the, what you'll need to ship to do will be fundamentally different. Here's a simple choice. Okay? Four and a half inch guns go down to a single a single gun per barrel. A single barrel. Single gun per mounting. And the reason they do that is because of maintenance and because it's decided a naval gunfire support, whilst useful, is not going to be a primary requirement, that guns are only going to be secondary in air defense and all sorts of things. And missiles are a one-shot, one-kill weapon. Okay? Nowadays, looking back at that and looking back at our times, that's incredibly hubristic. You're only going to fit one gun. Why not fit a double, a two-barrel scenario? Because then if one of your barrels jams, you're still able to fire the other one. And yes, it's more complicated. But the likelihood of both barrels jamming is a lot less than the likelihood of one, and either one of them jamming. And if it is working, it, it pretty much doubles your rate of fire. Now, you, once you get into triple and quadruple and you start going up the barrels, things get a little bit more complicated, but the scenario is there. And also, the traditional gun design had been a twin gun, so you'd have been keeping going with the traditional practice. So it makes sense to keep with the twin 4.5s, but we didn't. You can say the lessons of Falklands War, which again lead to the return of the gun being fitted after it had been removed completely from British warships in favour of missiles, that should have led to people going, well, hang on, hang on, hang on. The twin 4.5 might be useful to come back. But no, it hasn't. The gun came back, but it came back grudgingly. 
And now, now we're looking at scenarios and we are looking at a lot of scenarios with, in terms of air defense at sea, etc. And a lot of people looking at Italians who, when they were laughing enough for years with the 76mm and the fact that they've made it into the air defense tool they have done, and are going, well, hang on, maybe they were right because that's got an enormous magazine and they can reload that very easily anywhere, anywhere they want to, anywhere in the world. They can supply that logistically. You can't re you can't reload VLSs at current technology in currently in a satisfactory way at sea. We have lost the skill to do so, even if we did ever actually have it, considering the amount of times it actually exercised using those cranes on American on American Aegis vessels with it. And a lot of powers never even had those cranes and never even had that capability. So this is a problem. This is something we have to think about. And yet, logistically, sensibly, if you'd been going back to the beginning, you'd have always had those double guns. There were a lot of salesmen talking about how good missiles were. And let's be honest, when you see a missile fly and it hits the target in a test and it makes it go boom and you sit there and go, that's amazing. And you can see where the... And if you look at the... The, the thing I always give the example of again is the Falklands War when I talk about people doing, you know, the profiles, people were writing about the fleet, a fleet going south and how they were going to get annihilated. It was going to be like Toshima. Etc. You know, it was going to be that moment where the aircraft were going to wipe out a fleet. And the aircraft didn't wipe out a fleet because of reasons that I've got into. Logistics, timing, all sorts of complicated stuff of command procedures that mean that what was theorized to happen was never actually going to happen. But leaving that to one side, also what didn't happen was the missiles were not as effective as they marketed as being. Seawolf was still an amazingly effective weapon. It was not as effective as his marketing claimed it was. It was actually more effective than most people thought any missile actually would be, which is one reason why Seawolf and then and later CAM and various other systems pressure produced have proved quite so successful in terms of getting export attention. Because people looked at him and gone, eh, well, you lot do know what you're doing because you've done it. Um, but still, not as good as the marketing claim it was going to be. Steve Glock, so the RN build the Neptunes in mid-40s, as you suggest. In a recent video, could you postulate on the 1960 70s refits of modern technology? Well, that's the interesting thing. If you consider the size of the Neptunes, if they've been refitted to have their aft end become like the Tigers, as helicopter carriers, they've got a lot more space to carry a lot more helicopters. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you saw maybe their four and a half inch guns replaced with the three inch autos. They might keep the four and a half inch guns. It's going to depend. There's going to be a lot of ships that don't in service, so you could keep them. And honestly, you you could keep those in service. You could have. You could even go up. You might even end up with them having four of those. Um, on each vessel, so you know, two on each beam. Um, and having maintaining possibly their torpedoes, but possibly getting missile launchers. I wouldn't be surprised if they're getting some missiles. Again, they're going to have a lot more space, etc., for those missiles to be installed, so they might even get CDOT. And at that point, they could also, they would keep their 6-inch guns as well. Forward. And they get helicopters aft. And you can imagine the, the size of the vessel you'd be talking about, it'd be a far bigger, far more capable vessel, but it was, it's then going to have an impact on the Invincible class, because for them to be justified in the face of that capability, they're going to have to be a lot bigger and a lot more capable to be able to you know, justify themselves against that. Also, it might well be that that hull serves as, as the basis for the design of the Invincible class, in which case you're dealing with a far bigger hull, because if you consider the Invincible class... They are 209 meters long overall.
the Neptune class were going to be uh, were planned to be 202 meters overall, and they are a lot shorter. Or they are a lot smaller. If you are basing it on, are you taking it from an expanded hull, which is already starting out at 202 meters? I don't see how the Invincibles end up being less than 220, 230 meters, and that's going to have a massive impact on their capabilities. Because, okay, let's deal with the good old Sea Harrier, right? The Harrier, in terms of space, takes up fi roughly 15 meters by 10 meters, right? That's the sort of space you've got to have for it, 15 meters by 10 meters. So it's 150 meters squared. So if... Your carrier goes from being mm, 36 by 209 meters to 36 by roughly 230 meters. You are probably going to gain a lot of space. You're probably that. Let's be honest. That 30 meters is probably going to all be given to the hangar space. So 30 meters by 36. Let's say you're going to take that in a bit because you've got uh, things and buildings, etc. by this round. So let's say it's 30 by... Let's be generous to everything. Let's say 30 by 20, okay? You're dealing with 600 square meters. Now... 150 square meters. That's four more Harriers. And that's if you're giving the Harriers each their own box. You're not doing condensed parking. And that's four Harriers, more Harriers you can maintain and service. And why does that make a big difference? Well, if you consider your normal air group is going to be, what, 18 Harriers and 24 Sea Kings. That's what you planned for originally. Well, this could allow you to take up to 22, 24 Sea Kings, 24 Harriers possibly, and 24 Sea Kings. And that's going to have an effect on your operational capability because those six aircraft are going to fix into your operations. That's going to allow you to generate two more aircraft for all cap duties. If you've got 24 aircraft, you can very capably with generate four on cap, four in on alert, and have the rest cycling through far easily with 24 than you can with 18. And you can up it even more if you want to. You could have eight in the air, four on alert, and 12 going through various positions and transitions in between that. You couldn't do that with 24. You can't do that with 18. So, small changes can have big impacts long term. Max, sorry, most common unofficial equipment in World War II. <laughs> um, hey, yeah, the most common unofficial equipment. Um, yeah, the, the, the reason I'm pulling funny faces. I would say probably the cloche. Probably the cloche. But there's a few other things as well, which are probably inside there. That's right. You know, your explanation made me understand why the um, Hearts of Iron air author went for a twin 4.5 inch 55 count Mark 8B with, uh, with, the, uh, with the own timeline single mount. Yeah. It make, it makes more sense to go for a twin, uh, twin gun. I can't because of re um, alternate history Neptunes development of a volcano, like sub rounds for longer six inch uh, six inch range gun range could be, could have been especially. Let's put it this way. Again, the thing is, if the six inch guns stay in service long enough and are useful enough, there's going to be an argument for should we maintain a six inch gun capability going into our post the Falklands War. And the question is going to be: Are we going to build cruisers or are we going to give it to our destroyers? You know, that, the, the, the thing might be, and it might be from the, the, that point onwards, British destroyers have six-inch guns. That'd be interesting today. That would be very interesting if you consider the adaption. The stuff's been developed for five-inch guns. Imagine if that was being developed for a six-inch round. Uh, 
Uh, that's good. Wasn't Sea Slug most effective a psychological warfare weapon? Um, it was very effective as a psychological warfare weapon. It's also marginally effective as an anti-aircraft weapon, mainly from the fact that you, uh, effective, you saw it coming so much you ended up crashing into the ground to avoid it. I don't think I said I'm listening to Bertrams. I find myself wondering whether with the suggested Congo class like the development of for August subs, will someone be trying to offer fourteen inch guns? <laughs> They're always trying to offer the fourteen inch guns. Watch out but Daniel Politics, Nightbot is about. What is a cloche? Um Well, What is it? How do I best describe it? Basically, imagine a sort of mm, rubberized sock with a lead weight in it. There are various names for them. Mega screw. If the the real question is if the Type eighty two if the if the Neptunes are still around, the what are the Type eighty twos built for then? As the Type eighty twos were built uh, in uh, Type eighty two, the Neptunes are the command sh uh, command ships of any escort group. You don't need a Type eighty two to be a command ship. A modernized Type eighty uh, a modernized Neptune with sea dart fitted would be. More than capable of doing the job. But um, it could also have an effect on Type 82s because they could be the successors to the Neptunes. So that could be really interesting. Why did Type 24 inch torpedoes fall out of favor after World War II? Logistics. Logistics and handling them and the need for them. Just like a sock with half a brick. Yeah, that was also occasionally used. Um, seems like a piece of hose pipe filled with lead shot. Yeah. There are various options for how to make them. Uh, yes, 90% of the time... Uh, the, the thing is, I would say with... Um, It's basically, it's it. Nightbot has certain rules, and most of the time when people are spamming that many emojis, I thought it's, it's perfectly nine what we're doing. I suppose, uh, emojis, it's usually a spam bot trying to sell, um, uh, I, I, I would say nightly companionship, is how I would describe it. And um, yeah, as a rule, it stops it. A blackjack, that is, I think is another phrase for the description on, yes. Right then. Um, I think I've been live for almost two hours, so I will end the Q&A and just chat for the last nine minutes, and then it will be a case of I will go at nine o'clock my time, because um, honestly, I feel like getting to bed. I have my COVID injection tomorrow. I also probably will be... Jo I, I have to admit... Um, I will probably be joined by someone this evening. Uh, uh, the same person who spent the entire... Uh, by the way, please note. Oh, no, sorry. The person I'm being joined by will be the poodle. The senior fluffy research assistant basically decided the moment I was ill, he was going nowhere else. Uh, this is the longest we've been apart in 48 hours. He's a very loyal dog, a very loyal fluff, and whenever he went off to get food or anything like that, I would have the other one come and join and look after me. They are really lovely animals and really did take care of me. 
but I have no I have no doubt this evening, despite the fact that um, there is not really enough space for him. I am fairly certain I will be sharing a bed with a Santa Poodle. There's really not enough space for him in that bedroom. But it's an argument I won't win, because he will just be up there. Um, nice one. Does 24 inch or 24 and a half inch size see own kill friendly summoning warfare torpedo? And it does, but I wouldn't be surprised if you see this, that size returning. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a larger torpedo tube return, and there is a reason for this. It's My thinking is it's going to be for underwater, undersea, uh, underwater undersea vehicles. I wouldn't be surprised if we have a, a large version of torpedo tube return. I wouldn't be surprised if some submarines end up carrying a pair of larger tubes to launch such vehicles. And that's an interesting thing. But it's interesting this thing is how big is it going to be? Will it be 24 inches? Will it be 30 inches? Will it be 36 inches? These all been interesting things. Anyway, Q&A is now going to be over. In 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, gone. I always watch myself doing it and just go, hmm. And then we got the live chat. Alright. Yeah, that's finally. Poodles are very smart doggers. I have managed to feed her for 14 years. She would bark at me if I didn't pat her when I got home. She'd also notice mood change and want pats when I was feeling down. Yeah. We have standard poodles. They are really lovely and really loyal, and the reason we have standard poodles is honestly is because, this is going to sound terrible, but my view was I would be taking them for a walk most of the time, and I wanted a dog which was, uh, how do I put this, big enough, it felt like I was taking it for a proper walk. I had a friend who had miniature, pood miniature poodles, and they never seemed to take a, take a long walk. So we have standards. And the standards are incredibly low. Hi, David Goldman. Hi, John Trey. <whistles> That's good. I love the picture of Adrian's Bristol with the gun crew having pointed the gun at the bridge. What was that you said about the gun rushing being cut? Yeah. Here we go. UAVs, would not, you not use a uh, VLS as much rather than using torpedo tubes? Well, then the thing is, uh, you can't recover them. Whereas, theoretically, with a torpedo tube system, you could recover them. VLS, you cannot really recover them. Torpedo tubes, you can. They already have a system. We've been talking about making recoverable systems and working out all sorts of designs and pods for them. But this is one of the things we were talking about in... In... Bill Trumps recently, in the recent episode of Bill Trumps, and it was an interesting discussion. But the thing I was sitting there going, well, we've already got a system which exists to get things in and out that you can change around in a torpedo, in a submarine. It's called the torpedo tubes. So you could theoretically make a recoverable system which could go into a large enough torpedo tube. Uh, next story, before you had one poodle. We have one poodle now, but we had a poodle before that. So our previous poodle was a poodle called Mozart. Uh, he was a black standard poodle. And he ended up dying from epilepsy. He got stuck in a fit, and he couldn't come out of it. Um, I carried him to the vets. Probably, I shouldn't admit this online, but I'm not fairly sure how, if I kept the speed limit or not getting him to the vets that night. I wouldn't have cared if I got the tickets or anything, but um, we didn't have any trouble. It was basically f driving for about 1 a.m. Um, and the roads were empty. Got him to the all-night 24-hour vets, and he couldn't be got out of it. And he, he was stuck in that fit, the poor dog. And so we got him out. Uh, we, he, um, yeah, he went. And then that was about... Must be six years, six, seven years ago. And then we got Raleigh. And there is a picture of me somewhere. 
absolutely buried under standard poodle puppies. Because I decided there was not enough seats in the room, so I sat down on the floor. And all the puppies came to me. I had all the puppies. <laughs> They're all clambering over me. It was great fun. I was really happy. Um, and yes, Raleigh has come to us. And then we, now we've got also got Zebedee, our corgi. We usually have usually two dogs. It's rare that we go down to one. Um, Mozart, when he arrived, we had Monty, a Cocker Spaniel. And we hadn't gone up to Zegmon because Mozart got the mum... Mum had cancer. So basically, Monty went and then mum got ill. Recovered. She got ill again after Mozart went and recovered and that's when we got Zebedee. Uh, we got Raleigh, I mean. So, you know, that's sort of... Yeah. that That's why we only went down to one dog, but normally we have two dogs. Normally we do have two dogs. So, yeah. <laughs> Thunder Falls, I said go to bed. Yeah, I will be going to bed. Don't worry. Right. So, nice room. So, uh, uh, well, imagine if we uh, if VLS if we VLS Navy SEALs instead of using de dedicated tubes. Eh, it would be interesting. Um, right. Nice room. So, an old history thing I have been working on. The British got the Mark Forty Six torpedo in the forties, and then study and reverse engineer it into an eighteen-inch Mark Thirty One torpedo, and use it to make tigerfish reliable. Whew, that'd be fun. Eh, probably not. Uh, nice friend, I would never... Gannet cannot take it due to its size. If Gannet can take it due to its weight, and they can't because of its size, they'll modify the Gannet. Yeah, that was a few years ago. My mum had that. We were very lucky. She survived that one. She survived... She survived. She's done... She's done well. But, um, yeah, that was a fun time. That... The arthritis is the bigger problem now, but the cancer was a few years back. We are very lucky in the UK. We have pretty darn decent cancer treatment, and they caught it early. And so, yeah, she had operation, radiotherapy. I got shouted at by a couple of academics because I didn't publish anything for months because I was taking her to her from radiotherapy and sorting her out, and I just looked and went, yeah, life happens. Um, but that caused the whole gap in my CV, but yeah, it also, it also caused the gap in my sister's publishing record, so frankly, neither of us are too bothered on that front. Uh, but yeah, we did that, got her through it. She's had a rum old time, has mum, <laughs> last few years. Uh, she had um, my great aunt, who she was really close to, and my grandfather, her dad, went within a few months of each other. Uh, then divorced my father. A few years later, saw, uh, had a first bout of cancer. Then uh, we got back in contact with my father, had that relationship rebuild itself, and then uh, my dad died and then we had uh, then she got cancer lost had cancer uh, had about a scare of cancer again and then dog lost then had cancer come back and that actually caused operation that time and various other things and then yeah it, it gets it gets fun once you start going into the whole list it's been a fun few years we we, we basically yeah we have activities When I get permission for a pet, I'm thinking whip it. Pint signs Greyhound in a short. Uh, they are fast. They like a lot of exercise, but they are fast. Um, if you have sub launch recovery, uh, recovery UVs, does that make the subs ships then? It's an interesting question, but it's uh, I, I, basically I'm, I'm working on this one because I'm doing the future of strategy. 
scenario, and that's going to have an impact for interesting impact on strategy. And I previously suggested using Gurkhas instead of Marines, as they can be packed closer together, as on average shorter. You can say that to their faces, Dan. They will also be ca carrying quite a hefty load of weight uh, of weaponry. And I'm also SLGs. I'm fairly sure I registered a strategic weapon. Um, that's good. Ardmark 48 and Spearfish compatible with each other's launchers. I would say adaptable, not necessarily compatible. Take and key dress function. Um, yeah. The Brock, I'm not even daring to read that one out. I like to live. I have to, in the nicest way, every time I go to Sandhurst, I have to pass Gurkha guards. I, I, I don't want to. No. Thank you, Dan. I am. Um, thank you. Right then. That's like, for my 14 special community compatibility, I guess the tubes themselves are compatible. The black box on the end of the wire guns. Same, whatever your top is, five three three millimeter. Uh, if I remember correctly, they need they have to be. They are adaptable. There are issues with the can that some of the systems, but I'm not sure quite what they are. It's a whole load of electronics and tech stuff, which frankly goes. Whew, when I'm listening to it, because basically I think it most of it that seems is also one that's going is most of it is proprietary, 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 proprietary. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna say thank you very much, everyone. I am sensibly being ordered to bed. Go on. Uh, take care, everyone. Thank you and thank you. Night. I know I normally go through and say thank you to everyone, but I am gonna rush off quickly uh take care very much uh thank you very much for everyone for your chatting thank you very much for being here and hope you have a nice week and see you thursday because on thursday we have if i'm not mistaken and i'm gonna i'm gonna look it up and check it because i don't want to get it wrong on thursday we have Norway stands. World War Two. if normal if norway repels the german invasion and i already have that video recorded or at least I already have recorded once a version of Long Patrol. So that's good. Um, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Take care and have fun. Right, let's do that so I can get the stream control out. Toodles, everyone. Take care. Oh, and one last thing before I forget. Thank you to everyone who supports the stream, uh, supports the channel. Thank you to everyone who follows the channel, who likes the channel, who likes them, who likes and shares the videos, who's a member of the channel. Thank you to everyone who's a patron. It really does matter a lot. I apologize to the patrons. I know I promised that the vote would start this week on Sunday. It hasn't. It's going to start tomorrow because I was just not well enough to sort it out. But tomorrow I will get it sorted out. Um... Probably I'll do that. That'll be the other thing I'll do in the afternoon along with that, because that doesn't require... It's going to sound strange. I can do that while still a bit of whilst aching all over rather than actually having to think of anything. And um, so that, that'll be done tomorrow. The vote will go live for November's videos. will go live tomorrow, and that will last for a week. And I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, and take care.